Well, greetings once again. It is time for another Notes from the Turning Shop. This is Sam in Billings, Montana. And I'm going to start out this video with a promotion, a giveaway. I've been contacted by Beavercraft. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, really cool tools. I'll put up links to their website. And what they're going to do, they're going to donate a kit. I'll put that in the description. They sent me this kit, which includes three knives and uh, a spoon blank. Okay, and also a little strop, and I'll show you pictures of all that stuff. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to let this video uh, sit for about 10 days. Okay, then I'm going to pick one of the comments, and we're going to pass along one of these kits from Beavercraft to that person. Now, there's a, a little app you can get which you can apply to the comments on a particular video, and it'll pick randomly one of those comments, and we'll send that person one of these uh, carving kits. I think it'll be really cool from Beavercraft, so stay tuned for that, and if you're interested, well, hello once again. Welcome to my shop. A lot has happened since the last time I spoke to you. I've got a couple videos um, in the editing process that I'll get out to you guys in the next month, I promise you. One of those videos has to do with my brand new granddaughter. That's right. A little tiny girl, 4 pounds, 12 ounces, and I made a rattle for her. And it may be the next video that I put out. And the title of it is going to be, It's a Girl. All right. And then I'm going to do another video. I have a tradition when I visit my 15-year-old uh, granddaughter. I always go to uh, a particular store, and a, a woodworking store that has lots of really, really nice wood. And I pick something out, I make a video, and I make it for her. And I'm going to make two of them, one for little sister and one for big sister. That's another uh, project I've got in, in the works. Now, I'm going to mention something just briefly. Yesterday, I watched Glenn Lucas turn a thin walled bowl. He's doing live remote demos, and that's something that is really, really taking off right now because um, Symposiums and clubs have canceled meetings for the most part, and I think uh, it's going to be that way for a while. So anyway, uh, Glenn Lucas puts on live remote demos, and there were 85 people in this Zoom meeting. And one thing I'm thinking about doing is doing a little video on Zoom. If you're sitting out there and you're not sure about that, it's very simple. <laughs> It's not that difficult to do, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking about that. So if you think that would be something that would be a good idea, let me know. Okay, Zoom. I'm going to talk about two or three videos that I've done just recently. One of them is on a double insert. And here is the particular piece right here. And if I can find some pictures, I'll put them up more properly so you can see them. It's a little box with a kind of a tight fit, and I've got a holly insert in there. And I think that came out pretty good. Now, just FYI, I sell a lot of stuff on Etsy, so you can find me under Wyoming Woodturner. Sorry, Montana. Wyoming Woodturner on Etsy. Free shipping, and this will be something that will be on there along with a lot of other projects. Um, I've kind of gotten to the point where I don't mass produce stuff like I used to, and I make a video, I make something, and I put it on Etsy. Points of interest, perhaps, on that double insert video. I've got a holly insert, and I've got a, a note here that I put in there, work with clean hands, or else the holly gets really, really smudged up. This is from Brent Bowcroft, 
And in this video, I used a couple different tools and he was asking about the tool handles. He said, what tool handle are you using for the small gouges? Okay, I'm using a, a D-Way tool handle and I'm also using a Stuart Batty tool handle. I'll show you some pictures if I remember to put them up. Now he goes on to make a comment about the Grenadillo that I used for this double insert box and he was mentioning that if you look at the end grain, which he's right, it um, has some pores and he was just simply making a comment about filling those pores when you go through the finishing process. Denver Lewis, very beautiful box, thank you very much. How do you come up with your designs? I don't seem to have that talent. Well, I'll tell you what, for me, I'm not artistic. I really am not. I make some nice artistic stuff, but it's from a lot of experience and I think skill that I gained over the years and a lot of practice. And sometimes I make stuff that doesn't look very good and it's like it's sitting around in the dust. Um, I like this little box. I think it came out pretty good. Um, where, did, where did the design come from? I don't know. I just turn something until it looks good and I stop. <clears throat> okay, this is from Danny Boy. I am a beginner wood turner. I live in Canada. I know you have some one-way tools and that you speak highly of them. I was wondering what you would recommend if I had to get one bowl gouge and one spindle gouge. Let me go find a tool. Now, I was recently talking to somebody in Canada about a robust lathe. And there was a problem with shipping and the exchange rate. And anyway, if you're in Canada, you can uh, get stuff from One Way Tools. And this is one of my favorite tools. It's a, dumble, it's a double ended gouge, meaning there's a cutting edge on both ends. And you put that in the composite tool handle and this gets dull and you flip it around and you use the other end. I like this. They're a little bit pricey. Um, you can probably find less expensive gouges, maybe from one way, but I, I like this. This is a, a very nice tool. And you can also get a spindle gouge that has a double end like that, cutting edge on both ends. All right, I won't get in, I won't talk any more about tools. There's a lot of American tool makers um, and you, you don't have to buy European tools or English tools. There's enough tool makers in America. Um, you know, Doug Thompson and D-Way Tools and, and Trent Bosch and on and on and on. Um, robust Tools make some really fine gouges and I've purchased a few of those as well. So in Canada, you may have a problem getting them or paying a little bit more for them because of the shipping. Anyway, okay. Um, thank you, Danny boy. I won't sing, oh, Danny boy. Oh, and you know what? He goes on to say on the next page, here's my, my notes. There are notes. Um, he goes on to say, can you recommend a good scraper and parting tool? Here's a problem with that. Um, I probably have at least five or six or seven different profile configurations on scrapers and I probably have at least four different uh, types of parting tools, beading and parting tools, very narrow parting tools. Some of them that I've made, I have one hanging up. All right, now here's one of my favorite parting tools. This is a reciprocating saw blade and it's just in a funky little handle there. Very, very thin, a couple millimeters, less than an eighth of an inch. And that's a good way to go. But I'm, I'm not giving you a very good answer for scrapers and parting tools because there are so many different ones I think you need in a shop, like a, a square end scraper or a, a round scraper. Anyway, and also negative rake scrapers. Let me move on. Um, I notice, oh, this is from Wolf Cause, Wolf, Wolf. Okay, this is from Wolf. 
Hi Sam, I noticed you don't use carbide tip tools, either round or square. I find the square cutter can clean up both forward and backwards or sideways. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, it all has to do with the way you learned wood turning. Okay, I started 30 years ago and I made a lot of tools and eventually I found gouges spindle gouges and bowl gouges and I consider myself a cutter okay I don't start out with scraping tools I do use scraping tools a lot I've got a lot of scraping tools all my hollowing tools are scraping tools and they are also carbide tipped or they're steel the little round steel cutters I just don't know I can't speak for those kinds of tools the easy carbide cutting tools um, I just have no experience with that. When I turn a bowl, I use a gouge. Enough said. Is thread chasing difficult to learn? Mostly about fails on expensive wood blanks. That's a good point. Um, this is also from Wolf. Um, thread chasing is a little bit difficult to learn. And he makes the point that if you mess something up on exotic, expensive wood, well, you've messed up an exotic, expensive piece of wood. Um, it's hard to do thread chasing or practice thread chasing on cheap, soft wood, not cheap. Anyway, what's the difference between a bedan and a square end scraper? Um, a bedan is really a negative rake scraper because it's got a bevel on the top and the bottom. A square end scraper is a traditional scraper with a square top. Let me see if I can find one over here. Here is a bedan. Let me see if I can, i use my good hand. Okay, I would consider this a negative rake tool. It's certainly a cutting tool if you use it in that orientation, but you can also scrape with it. All right, now a square end scraper is uh, just what it sounds like, but it doesn't have two bevels. It's only got one bevel. The next uh, video I'm going to comment on is the identifying bowl gouge grinds. Now, I could spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to make this as quick as I can. Had a lot of good comments and some criticism for the way I presented uh, bowl gouge grinds. It's an enormous topic, okay? And I certainly didn't, you know, I could have spent hours and hours doing it. I tried to make it as simple as possible. But anyway, this is from Glenn Crandall. Some good information, Sam. I think you did well considering your time constraints. Thank you. Uh, it is difficult subject due to the various terminologies in use. And I found, as I mentioned in the video, I found that a lot of the information out there is a little confusing. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to veer off for just a second and... I made some comments about parabolic and elliptical, okay? And in my poor mind that isn't very well versed in math, um, I mentioned that elliptical and parabolic are pretty much the same. Well, they're not. And is uh, Nolan Tyrell, I hope I'm saying that right, so Nolan Tyrell pointed out that there's a difference uh, elliptical is, is like a circle. It's, it's a closed geometric form. It's elliptical, but it's closed. Um, a parabolic curve is open. It just goes out and doesn't reconnect. I hope you get what I'm saying here in, in my gesticulations. I'm better with words than math. Anyway, um, he made a good point. And my reaction was, oh, wait a minute, they're the same thing. Well, they're, they're not the same thing. So I did a little bit more research on the topic this morning, actually. And what made me think about this was Glenn Lucas. I've got one of Glenn's, actually, I've got two or three of Glenn's DVDs. They're excellent. And he talks about in his shop, and he teaches a lot in his shop, and he will not have anything but a parabolic curved bowl gouge. Let me find the quote here from Glenn, someplace in the literature. 
This is from his website, perhaps. This gouge is profiled with a parabolic flute, which is the only flute profile you'll find in my shop. Okay, that's Glenn Lucas. Now, let me give you another bit of information here. <clears throat> this is from a Robert Sorby tool. This is a description. It's a 3 8 inch uh, bowl gouge. This gouge has an elliptical slash parabolic flute. Okay, so Robert Sorby uses both those terms to describe this particular bowl gouge. Can you see where the confusion comes in? I'm going to quit there before I get in any more trouble. Uh, elliptical and parabolic. Now, mostly what I was trying to do in the video was to distinguish between a V-shaped, a U-shaped, and you know, an elliptical, and I just kind of generalized too much. Okay, this is from Billy, 1946. Now, I really appreciate this video, answered a lot of questions I had. When turners make videos, I find it very hard to see where the flute is or how the tool is rotated, okay? I wish sometime you would all color the flute so that we could see it easier. Now, that's exactly what Glenn Lucas does in his shop, and I have a bowl gouge here. Now, I've got a little color on this right here, and right here, all right? And what I do is I, I color code my tools so somebody in my shop who is a new uh, wood turning student can look at that and I've got a chart on the wall. Okay, that's kind of a, a maroon, that's a bowl gouge. Yellow is a spindle gouge. Not quite what, what Billy is asking. And what Glenn does is he takes a marker and right down the center he puts a red line. So as you're turning, you don't want to have that flute open too much because you can see the red line, you get in trouble with that cutting edge. So you turn it over where you can't see the, the red line and that's where you present the tools to the wood. That's an excellent comment. I, th I think that's a good idea. I may think about doing that. All right. <clears throat> oh, Nick. Cropat, Nick, anyway. Um, as a newish wood turner, I try to absorb as much experience as I can. With only two gouges currently, it's tough to experiment with changing grinds. So I don't want to waste any tool steel regrinding, so info like this is very valuable. Now, that's an issue. Okay, I've got lots of tools I've collected over 20 or 30 years. I've got lots of different grinds on my bowl gouges and my spindle gouges, and that helps a lot because I can just go to a different tool. Um, if, you're, if you only have a couple tools, and I totally agree, you don't want to just grind them every time you're looking for a different profile, maybe an option is to go to a scraping tool. You know, when you can't reach uh, the inside of a bowl with the bowl gouge, maybe go to a scraper. Okay, Marvelous Mushroom Mold. Okay, that was a fun project. And if I can find it. Um, somebody, and I'm not sure if I've got the question right here, somebody was asking, they would like to see me chuck this up. And I started to actually turn this a little bit, and I'll probably make a video out of this. I was thinking about making a birdhouse. All right, and what I've got on the inside is a little ledge right there, like a shoulder. And that's where the birdhouse will fit up in there and get glued. So right now I can use that as, a, as an expansion recess. And I can put that on a, a scroll chuck and turn it, which I have done a little bit. Anyway, good, good question. I can't remember where that came from. I got ahead of myself a little bit. That question came from Rodney Stewart. Thanks for the awesome video. I'm very interested on in how you're going to attach that to the lathe. All right, well, we'll show that in a video sometime. I think I've already answered that sort of. Glenn Crandall, again. I also wonder about some form of mold release. Now, I probably got 10 uh, remarks about that when I did that 
um, <clears throat> that video on this and I had uh, two funnels and I used them for molds. I did use mold release and I put a lot of applications on there but I think just because of the profile of the funnels wouldn't come out of there very easy but anyway moving right along dust collection tour I, I gave you a little bit of a, a tour of my shop and where my dust collection system is and how it's working I think it's uh, it's really good and somebody along here ask you know would you change anything actually I, I think I did pretty good you know I set up four or five different shops it's always fun but it's a challenge and I think my desk collection is uh, is pretty good could you explain when you use it my desk collection system do you collect all the shavings from rough turnings in the collection system I really don't um, one thing I've tried to do when I'm turning cast resin is to have my dust my dust hood very close and I just pick up all that debris and put it in my dust collection that's one time when I, when I keep that close if I'm turning I'm getting a lot of shavings I don't really collect them that way just sweep them up how do you suppose <clears throat> how do you dispose of the shavings compost trash fire um, when I was down in Warland, I burned a lot of my scraps. I put a lot of stuff in, in my, uh, my wood stove. But you got to be careful with sawdust and shavings because it can kind of explode on you. Be careful with that. Um, I don't compost it. Uh, most of it just goes to the dump. You know. <clears throat> Danny Sweet, uh, you have one heck of a shop. Thank you. It, it is a wonderful shop. How many square feet? Uh, the building is 40 by 40. Okay, so it's right at 1,600 square feet. Now, my shop in Worland was a little bigger than this, like 200 square feet. But I've set this up with rooms a little different, and I'm very happy with the layout. Uh, I got enough room I can park a vehicle over there. Anyway, thank you very much for tuning in. I appreciate it. and. Uh, I will talk to you next time.